Hey, it's me. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us. It's a great pleasure to welcome this special artist on this episode of the Paul Leslie Hour, Randy Seymour. I met him a few years back. I headed off to Nashville, Tennessee. I was looking for some authenticity. And authenticity is, is not always everywhere you look, but I found it with Randy Moore. I'll never forget walking into that bar. I was looking for something that would touch my soul and touch my heart. And there he was. He was standing up and he was playing some of my favorite songs. And I remember you, you called me Mark Twain. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's an honor to talk to you again. It's good to be here. Thank you for having me back. Uh, you're, you've been a busy man. And in these times of where people are getting all their entertainment and from their laptop, I know that, that you've been well appreciated by thousands and thousands. Have to be. so. Well, that's very kind of you. So you have this new album out. It's called Lufkin. It's been yep. getting good reviews from a lot of people. And um, we're going to talk about this, that, and, and the album and anything else that comes to mind. Great. So maybe you have a song from that album that you, you think would give people a little idea about what it's like. Well, um, actually every song on there has a little piece of, of something of what it's like, but um, this song that I want to play here first is a song that I wrote uh, about going fishing with my dad and it's appropriately, appropriately uh, titled daddy. I want to go fishing. Um, I was fortunate enough to sing this song while my dad was still around. So it was one of his two favorite songs that I ever wrote in my whole life. So Obviously, whenever I sing this thing, um, wherever I'm somewhere, I'm always thinking of dad. So sometimes I get a little choked up, but I think I'll be okay today. This is Daddy, I Want to Go Fishing. You ready for this? I'm ready, and I know everybody out there is ready as well. Here we go. <laughs> stars were in the sky 4 a.m. on the 5th of July we headed out to Toledo Bend me and daddy going fishing again he said we'll be there in an hour or so Charlie Rich was on the radio I said I hope that we get lucky today he nodded his head then I heard him say if the good Lord's willing and the mercury runs we'll be on the water for the sun with rods reels and spinner baits we'll cast our troubles out into the lake this life is a whole lot better when the fishing's fine there's a little bit of heaven at the end of that line now we pulled in the choctaw camp to ease that fast boat down the ramp Held the rope while he parked the truck. I caught myself waking up. He got us out to our honey hole. How he finds it, I'll never know. I said, all these trees look alike. He said, son, you can trust an old Indian guide. When the good Lord's willing and the mercury runs, we'll be on the water before the sun. With rods, reels, and spinner baits, Cast our troubles out into the lake Cause life is a whole lot better when the fishing's fine There's a little bit of heaven at the end of that line Now when I think about my daddy, I think about fishing and I think about fishing every day When I die and leave this place I want to see my daddy's face Say, get the rods and reels, son We're heading to the lake A million stars were in the sky 4 a.m. on the 5th of July We headed out to Toledo Bend Me and daddy going fishing Again La 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 la. Come on, let's go fishing. 
la 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 Grab the rods and reels, how do you feel? Son, don't you want to go fishing? Daddy, I want to go fishing. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you there, Mr. Paul. <laughs> Beautiful song. Yeah, yeah. And I know it's something that so many people can relate to. You know, they can relate to fishing with their their buddy or their grandfather or their father. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. It, uh, I, uh, I'm uh, on this Lovekin album. I'm I'm sort of making a conscious effort, but then sort of a subconscious effort to bring people along on stories. Uh, I don't really want to preach to them. Um, I don't really want to teach any lessons i'm 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 old enough to know that you know the only lessons you learn are the ones that that are you know they come to you and and uh <laughs> they're not written on something a lot of times they they kind of get written inside of you so um I, and I, it's not that i'm wanting people to escape into the stories it, it's mm -hmm. uh they're just kind of like honest narratives i suppose of uh things that um i've been in and been out and been back in you know so um we, we got another song we're going to do actually that you and I, we haven't talked about this, but um, I can tell you a little bit about it. If you want to, if you want to hear about that. Yeah, absolutely. Let's hear about it. Okay. Um, you had picked out this uh, song. It's called back in the day. And I, I'll tell you the story about this song. First of all, um, there's a lot of lyric in this song that appears to be relevant uh, to today's times, so to speak. Well, I'll tell you, Paul, that song was written over 25 years ago. Hmm. So, it, it tells me after basically the song sort of coming back to me and around in my head that um, as much as people, you know, think that, you know, we're advancing and we're moving forward, not a lot changes and, and <laughs> we're human beings. And, and until we start growing another arm and another leg, you know, besides the two arms and the two legs that most of us normally have, <laughs> the, the things remain a lot, a lot the same. So, um, this song started out being another, had another title to it. And I won't tell you the title because I don't like the title anymore. I, th I thought it was great back then, but, but this was one of those things where um, when you write songs in Nashville, you, uh, you kind of have these novel ideas about things and go, yeah, this will be great. You know, it's just catchy enough. And, and um, I kind of, I'm kind of not into catchy anymore. I'm kind of into, let's 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 just be honest okay if, mm -hmm. it, if it catches if honesty can catch on then that's a good thing so so i retitled it back in the day because um recently recently i kept hearing people say well back in the day um this and that and so forth and such and a lot of times um if you think of it and, and this is the way i think of it maybe i think too much you know when you look back on things a long time ago they always seemed like they look better than they actually were when you were living them. <laughs> it's True. Just, it just, it just turns out that way. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's kind of a natural thing. And it's kind of good to maybe look back on something and, and, and be happy that, that, you know, you had something that you feel like was, was um, working or, or maybe it was solid or something like that. Um, so we wrote this song. It was a guy named Jesse Hunter and I wrote it, and we recorded it, demoed it, and it turned out really good. Everybody would, was liking the way it sounded. But then when I pulled it out this last year, and I, I looked at the lyrics first because the lyrics kept coming into my head, but the melody was all wrong. The hook that we had was all wrong. And, you know, for lack of a better term, I told my wife, I said, you know, this song is really great, but I sound like an angry white man. <laughs> and she goes, well, are you? I said, no, I'm, I'm not an angry, I'm not an angry anything. You know, I'm, I'm really just, I just really just want to kind of just keep developing my understanding for things, if nothing else. So, so I applied the, the title back in the day, and then I applied things that, that sort of kind of rounded, kept rounding out that, that, um, sort of that theme, I suppose, so to speak. So let me go into this and just see. And, and once again, I'm, I'm going to go back to what I said earlier about my record. It's, you know, none of, all of this is kind of 
personal. And, and I always like to refer to what John Lennon used to say about songs. You know, they ask him, all oh, they always ask him, you know, about because he seemed to be a very uh, strongly outspoken, outspoken socially and political person. And he really, he finally told people, he said, look, he said, I write songs. He says, he says, I write songs because I am an observer, mm. which means like any author, he's sitting back and he's telling the story from his point of view and he wants other people to draw something from it. And maybe they draw things from it that he never imagined they would. You know? <laughs> and that's, I think that's a, I think that's a, almost a darn near perfect description of someone who's an artist or a storyteller. They, they create the painting um, in their own image. Then they sit back and they, they just don't try to tell people what every color and whatever nuance of that painting is about. They just say, look at it. There it is. <laughs> and if they, and if, and if I tell people what a song means to me, I don't want that to necessarily mean the same thing to them. I'm just telling them what it means to me because once again, I'm going into my point of, of as a songwriter, as a creator, as a, as a composer, I'm an observer and, and, and I interpret these things kind of like what was the whole thing they used to say about uh, computer programming, garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. <laughs> so geo, geo. So, so anyway, this is called back in the day. And, um, 25 years ago, all this lyric stuff was written, and I just all everything that's been happening in the last couple of years has reminded me of this. So, uh, so here it goes. It goes like this. We pledge allegiance to the flag, believe in the republic that it stands for. Standing by our desk in school while the teacher wrote the golden rule on the blackboard. Now prayer in schools against the law, trouble in those simple hallowed halls. And the writing on the walls are saying things we never thought at all. Back in the day, before the world got out of hand back when we cared for our neighbor and our kin back when all god's children thanked the lord up above before we lost our faith and forgot just how to love maybe i'm a fool but i still believe we can work this out and all live hand in hand Try to learn from the mistakes that we once made back in the day. Black and white can't get along. Everyone's right and no one's wrong. It's crazy. And justice that was once for all has all but turned its back and gotten lazy and the brave who died to free this land would find it hard to try and understand how we the people forgot the plan written for every child woman and man back in the day before the world got out of hand back when we cared for our neighbor and our kin back when all god's children thank the lord up above before we lost our faith and forgot just how to love maybe i'm a fool but i still believe we can work this out and all live hand in hand try to learn from the mistakes that we once made back in the day I'm a fool, but I still believe we can work this out and all live hand in hand. There was a time before we learned to hate back in the day.
<laughs> All right. <laughs> a real fine song, Randy. Well, thank you. I, really I'm, nice. I'm, I'm proud of it. I'm 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 proud of of I'm proud that that um, you and I live in a place where we can say things and and uh, we can we can express our honesty uh, and uh, and basically try to do the right thing, you know, and, and, and that's, that's, that's really important. I, that's, I think it's more important to, to have the right reasons for doing something than pretty much the, than it is anything else when you do stuff, you know, hmm. um, I, I look at people and, and the, and the things they, they do. And when I see the reasons that they do it for, that's, that's where I always, you know, find the core of, of, you know, either why I like it or why I probably am not really very fond of it that's i mean i'm gonna i'm gonna be honest with you that's why i i like your show because you know you have this you have this love for for entertainers songwriters creators musicians you have a you have a true like passion for it and um like any any successful business um is built on failure and passion and if you fail enough, you'll succeed. And if you have the passion, then your failures won't matter. You know, they'll basically add up to the success eventually. So that's, uh, yeah, I, you know, you can, you can kind of look at, um, I, I, I take this example because I asked my dad one time, my dad was a, my dad was an air force pilot and then he became a commercial airline pilot and he flew for a, a solid carrier that were called Delta airlines. And um, they were always financially Delta airlines always did very well. But after my dad retired, um, they had a new um, few years after that or so, I can't remember how, you know, how long it was, but anyway, they had a time where they hired somebody to, to be the CEO and all these kind of, and the different guys that they had hired knew nothing about the flying industry at all. They just had to be guys who were, had a great resume. They were successful at another uh, company or something. And they pretty much almost sent, the company down the tubes. And I asked my dad, I said, why is this happening? I said, how can this happen? He said, son, he said, the person who's in charge of something and who's running it has to have a passion for it. They have to be willing to say, you know what, I'm not going to eat dinner tonight in order to make sure my business works, you know? And um, he said, the guy that started Delta Airlines, he said, he was a pilot. He had a passion for flying. He wanted to do something good for people with his flying. So he developed his his little company, which was basically like a crop dusting company. He bought some planes and, you know, turned them into passenger planes. And they, they fly little trips from Atlanta to Shreveport or, you know, to Mobile or something like that. You know, anything, you know, to to kind of I don't know. It was his passion to to create, you know, a, a carrier that could get people from Atlanta to Mobile, I guess. Maybe, mm -hmm. Who knows? Maybe his grandmother lived in Mobile. I don't know. But, you know passion, you know, is, mm -hmm. is what really makes something work. So, so these songs on this Lovekin album, um, I'm backing them with a lot of passion. <laughs> it's very important. And, and thank you for those kind words. I really very much appreciate you saying that. Well, it's true. You know, I'm, I, heck, you know, I, I don't have any reason to blow smoke on anybody at this point. Um, and I, I sold all my stones for glass houses years ago, so um, <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> well, the last time that we, we talked, you were still in Nashville, yep. and now you're in Texas, which is a yes. nice place to be. But tell us, what do you find is the biggest difference between the audiences in Nashville and the audiences in Texas? And I well, know Texas well, is a big place. <laughs> um, as far as audiences go, um, when you play in Nashville, you get a you get a wide variety of 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 a spectrum of people. Um, in Texas, you you get a little bit more of a focused um, um, audience, so to speak. Say, for instance, in Nashville. Um, I'll, I'll just give you, for instance, uh, we'll use a, we'll use cover songs, for instance, in Nashville. In Nashville, um, if I, if I experienced in any of those places, uh, I had to have at, at the ready to be able to play a song that would appeal to um, 
a bunch of bridesmaids, you know, some kind of song that, 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 that they liked. Usually it was uh, something like Fishing in the Dark by the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. They love that darn thing. Um, I had to have something that appealed to people who were not from this country. So you always have, no matter who you are, I don't care what kind of music you play. If you want to play for an international audience, by God, learn John Denver's Country Roads. Everyone knows that song. Okay. So you had to have things like that at the ready. Here in Texas, you're not necessarily um, having to uh, be, that, that, that's not necessarily in front of you. What you have more is you have a lot of home folks and they have a, they have a wide variety of tastes here that they listen to, but it's all based, most of it is based on what really can't, comes out of here. Like for instance, when people think of a blues artist, in Texas, they're automatically going to think of Stevie Ray Vaughan. Mm. Uh, they'll think of Lead Belly. They'll think of people like that, people who really originated in Texas. So um, when they think of a country artist, I'll give you a funny story. Um, I was playing uh, an engagement last Saturday night, and I was on my break, and I was talking to a lady, and um, she said, um, she said, boy, I really, I really am glad that you know some George Strait. I said, well, you have to know George, some George Strait if you're going to play here in Texas. She goes, yeah. She says, it's funny. She says, um, we were in, um, she says, we were in Boston and we were riding in a cab. And she said, do you remember when John Denver, his plane went down? And uh, I said, yeah. She goes, well, we were in Boston and the guy that was driving the cab, he was not from the United States. He was from India or something. And he was very upset. And, and he said, I'm so upset. He said, where, where are you from? And, and he said, well, I'm from India somewhere. And he asked where they were from. They said, well, we're from Texas. And he said, well, I'm so upset today because the, the world's greatest country singer died today. And they got the people in the, in the back seat, the people I was talking to, they got all upset and said, no, no, not George Strait. He goes, <laughs> who? He goes, he goes, no, John Denver. <laughs> and they, they almost, they, they had to, keep themselves from laughing because they yeah. don't think of John Denver as a, as the greatest country singer in the world down here. They think of George Strait is he's, he's considered the King at this point here in Texas. So, so there's a different audience. The thing, the thing that differs from Nashville that differs from Texas most for me is when I moved to Nashville, um, I moved there to do pretty much to, to, to be a country star and be a country artist. And I was that, not in the star sense, but in the artist sense. But the more important thing that happened was, is I learned from the best how to write songs, how to craft songs, how to, how to deliver messages and songs. And I also learned from the best how to make records. Um, you have people in Texas who write songs, you have people in Texas who make records and they're, they're good at them. But in Nashville, you have a great, con a very great concentration of those folks because a lot of them move from all the other places. The guy who plays drums on all my records is originally from Memphis. His name is Greg Morrow. He's played on, uh, uh, let's see. Um, he played on the eliminator album for ZZ top. That's the kind of records he's played on. He tours with Bob Seger and he's a, he's a pretty much an in-demand guy, but he lives in, he lives in Tennessee, lives in the Nashville area because it's a, it's a, still a hotbed of, of recording mm. and recording sessions if you want to have the best sounding records that you can make. And Nashville is definitely one of those places where you do that. So that's the thing that differs from me from Nashville uh, or from Tennessee from, to Texas. Last thing is um, there's so much music going on in Nashville and in Tennessee. A lot of times it gets to be almost like a white noise here there's a lot of music going on, but it's kind of spread out. So when people hear it, they seem to be more excited about it when they, when they're in front of you, which is kind of neat because um, that's what I get when I go overseas, when I play in places like Monaco and, and China and, you know, different places like that, you know, people get excited about what I'm doing and I don't necessarily have to convince them that, that it's, it's, this is really fun. You know, they immediately um, are immersed in it they, they immediately get into it so i like the energy that, that happens here in this state it's it's a it's a good it's a real um it's a real alive uh, i mean for lack of a better word it's a it's a very electric uh type of feeling here 
uh, when you're playing in front of people. Um, you almost don't know what to expect when you're playing. Uh, it, it's 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 kind of neat, you know. And I like that because it, for somebody who's on stage, you know, it's all well and good to be rehearsed and be able to do things that are predictable, but it's much more fun when things just happen that you don't expect, you know. So, so that, that's that's one of the reasons why I do like here. And also, this was my home. This is where I grew up. I grew up in this part of Texas, so it feels like home. So that's a, and and you you probably know how that feels when when you're gone from a place that you grew up in and you go back, even if nobody there that you know, you feel you feel like it feels like a, it has a different feel than anywhere else that you go. So, mm. so that's why I like it here. <laughs> Well, this question, it, it, it came from somebody who uh, you know very well. And uh, I thought this is a great question. And she asked, why do you believe there is so much unhappiness in much of the world today? Quite a question. Um, yeah. Well, let me start off by saying there's not a whole lot of unhappiness in my world. Um, I seem to be able to view a lot of unhappiness. Um, and I don't know, sometimes I don't know if that's the majority or if that's the prevalent thing, or if it's just something that, that seems to be something that, you know, they want to show you all over and over again. And I'm talking about, you know, the television and, and the computer and all that kind of stuff and everything. But if there is a, if there is a vast amount of unhappiness, um, which I know there is, um, I think, I think it's, I think it probably stems from kind of being fed unhappiness. We seem to be like, it seems like we're being fed more unhappiness than, than a human being really should have to, to be able to ingest. I mean, of course, you know, you have to live in the reality. Everything you, you can't, it's, there's no fantasy world uh, as much as maybe some folks might want to like to create a fantasy world, you know, real, real is real. And you, you, you can't change that. So I don't know, just if it, it feels like to me that, that we're being, we're being fed a lot of uh, unhappiness and, and people, I think it goes back to the GOG garbage in garbage out. A lot of times, you know, um, a lot of times if somebody tells you enough that uh, you're a failure, even if it's a lie, you'll start to believe it. So, um, and, it, and it's hard because there's so much that's going on nowadays than say 50 years ago, we're exposed to a lot more stuff um, and things move really fast. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, I, my hat's off to these young kids because they're a lot faster at things than I ever was at their age. I mean, do you experience that? Have you seen how kids can, can yeah. pick up on things and, <laughs> And, and uh, you know, you watch these talent shows on television and I see these kids that are in their teens and Paul, they sing like they've been singing for 45 years. I mean, they just smoke on the stage. And I go, how did they learn that at such a young age? I mean, it, how, do, how do they how do they how did they get there? That's it's amazing to me, you know. To me, that's a good thing about, you know, the, the, you know, mountain of information that, 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 you know, is, you know, kind of passes through our, our lives every day. But um, I think it, everything needs to be maybe tempered a little bit more. We need to, people need to seek, seek balance. If they want to seek peace, they need to seek, seek, seek some sort of balance in their life, you know, balance it out. Um, you know, I quit watching the, um, I quit watching the news cycles. I don't know, probably, I'm going to say it was probably six years ago. I don't really watch any of the news cycles. I'll pick up headlines and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll talk to people and I'll hear people and everything, but I don't really watch a lot of those news cycles anymore because um, a lot of it, you know, if you go back and you look at what they were saying and then you, you bring it into the day, you go, well, you, this is just the same thing you were saying. You, you just kind of repackaged it and, you know, just... So I try not to, I try not to let, let that affect me a lot. And so 
I kind of, I gave up on it. I mean, believe me, I was one of those guys who was, I was listening to talk radio and I was, I was watching the news and, you know, I'd watch the Fox and I'd watch the CNN and I'd, I'd watch them all, you know, and I'd get, I'd get angry and I'd get upset and all this kind of stuff. And I came to a point where I was like, you know, I'm just, I'm just getting like all worked up over somebody else's deals. You know, I need to, if I'm going to have trouble, I want, I want to own it. <laughs> I want it to be mine. <laughs> so I think, I think, uh, I think a lot of trouble is being outsourced to people who, you know, would otherwise probably have a little more peace in their life and, and, and really be able to, to like look at things um, with the, and, and this is sometimes this, this is probably a, a bit of a fantasy too, but I'm going to go there anyway. Look at, look at the, the half full, you know, cup instead of the half empty cup, you know, um, we, we have a lot of problems and, and there are people who have true beliefs that, that we need to put on a fast track and get there. And I'm here to tell you, human beings do not change quickly. They just don't, we don't, we don't adapt quickly. We can learn quickly and we can, um, we can do things you know, technically we can advance ourselves, but, but our insides, you know, are, are, um, you know, I guess some people would call it their soul. Some people would call it their spirit, whatever, whatever that is that, that kind of is like your, your inner voice or your inner self, it doesn't move very fast and it doesn't seem like it wants to move very fast. So, um, you know, maybe, maybe the, maybe a lot of the troubles in the world uh, the, 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 are, they're not being manufactured, but they're being told to us a lot, a lot. And um, maybe we just need to kind of listen to ourselves a little bit, you know, because I, be I believe, and, and this could be another fantasy too, I don't know, but I, I believe that, that everyone, everyone is born with goodness in them. And I think that they're only basically taught to not be very good. I don't, I don't know that there's that many people who are just born, you know, just completely wrong. You know, I think that there's people who are born that people don't understand them, you know, you know, understanding would be a really, really good tool. And I think kindness would be a really good tool. You know, if we could just practice kindness and understanding, you know, um, you know, maybe some, something as simple as, you know, before you say something about somebody or, or write something down about somebody, give it some thought, have a little vision, you know, you know, don't, don't want to, don't, I, 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 I try to exercise one thing in these days is, is I try to, to take whatever it is that I'm saying or I'm doing and I try to go, okay, how am I going to feel about this in a few years? <laughs> you know, I mean, I know how I feel about it now, but it's like people always say, um, sleep on it you know yeah i think that's i think that's still good advice paul you know when something when something happens or something you know you can react to stuff but a lot of times i think i think if you're going to have a quick reaction that means you probably should be a, a test pilot and your quick reaction should be to something that is going to keep you from getting killed <laughs> <laughs> you know <laughs> you know it's a, i think it's okay to take it slow so if we could all just kind of slow down and, you know, it's funny because as much as nobody wants to admit it, I think more people got to slow down last year and they didn't like it, but it did a lot of good in a lot of, in a lot of ways. Look how much cleaner the air got. And, you know, did you, you, you remember seeing all the pictures of all the skylines where people, you know, well, this is what it looked like, you know, back, you know, in, in, you know, 2017, this is what it looks like today. You're like going, wow, <laughs> I can yeah. see, I can see the mountains beyond that building, you know? <laughs> so maybe, we, maybe if we just kind of slow down and try a little understanding and try a little kindness uh, and maybe, maybe lead with that, lead with some love and some kindness and understanding. And, and, you know, I don't know if I'm sounding preachy or not, but I don't want to sound preachy. I, I, I really just want to practice whatever it is that, that I believe in and um, kind of take care of whatever troubles are in a, my own backyard, you know, kind of, you know, tidy up myself before I ever go out and try to help or tell somebody how to tidy themselves up, I suppose. So, Well, for anybody who listens to this Lufkin album 
Is there something in particular you want them to get from that experience? I want them to realize that this was a, this was a record, first of all, that was recorded out of pure um, something absolutely going right, you know, in someone's life, everything in there. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, funny stuff. There's a lot of strange stuff in there. I mean, I've got a song about, I've got a song I wrote about um, uh, Lucifer. Uh, it's called devil for hire. And um, uh, you, you, you know, the story of paradise lost written by Milton where um, Lucifer is tossed into the pit because he um, basically has a disagreement with the almighty and the almighty. He tells him, well, it's better to rule down here than it is to serve up there. Um, my point of view from that and my little song devil for hire is, well, actually they were in a meeting and God stood up and said, look, um, I've invented man and things aren't going to go well. I got to have something to scare him, you know, into being good. So we're going to invent this really horrible place, but somebody's going to have to run it for me. I got, I got nobody, uh, I can't run it. So this guy, Lucifer, who happens to be uh, the Almighty's oldest friend and was the oldest angel at the table, he says, look, he says, I've been in this thing since the beginning, so I'll help you out, bud. I'll go down there and I'll run hell for you, okay? <laughs> so, so in my song, it wasn't, it wasn't a disagreement. It was actually a business agreement <laughs> that, mm. that Lucifer should be, you know, the ruler of, of uh, purgatory. And what's, what's funny about all of that is, is it's all taken from a very uh, Christian, Judeo-Christian sort of a standpoint. And there's no other religions, I don't think, that actually have a hell besides Christianity. So, um, but I just thought it was, it was, it was, uh, once I started down that road and I played it for my wife, she says, you've got to put that on this album. I said, yeah, I, I, I kind of thought that too, but I, I needed to hear somebody else tell me. <laughs> But what I want people to get out of the album is um, I want them to I'd like for them to be able to listen to it and, and feel the same way that I feel about where I live and what I'm doing now. And um, it, it came to me as um, we were walking through a one of these big multi, you know, department type uh, hardware stores, you know, the big ones that you go to where you can't find anything. And, and then when you find somebody who is supposed to find something, they can't find it either. Um, so. So there was this guy working there and we were looking for, I can't even remember what we were looking for that day. So I asked the lady at the front, I said, is there anyone who can help us? She goes, let me make a call. And I thought, okay, we'll be standing here for a while. Well, we weren't staying there for a while. And two minutes later, this young guy showed up. His name was Jimmy. And so Jimmy, I said, Jimmy, we need to find this. He says, okay, follow me. I was like, oh, great. He knows where we're going. I said, Jimmy, how are you doing today? He said, sir, he said, I am blessed and not stressed. And I went, wow, that's the way it feels around here, man. So I wanted to make a record that kind of felt blessed and not stressed in a way. So I, th I think that's what I'm hoping to pull off with this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe in closing, there is some song from the album that you'd like to send all the, the viewers and listeners on their way with. Well, let's see here. Um, it's a good well, selection. What, what I'd like to do, I'd like to do this because um, uh, a lot of these songs, besides the one that was written 25 years ago, a lot of these songs sort of came as a sort of stream of consciousness uh, actually in this room uh, in the early morning hours. Uh, I, uh, I write songs primarily um, out of um, silence and boredom. And it's very silent and very boring in here just before the sun comes up. So I can listen to what's going on in my insides. And when I play the guitar, it just, it sounds like the biggest thing in the world. So it almost feels like, I know it just sounds like a guitar now, but believe me, first thing in the morning, when you play something like this, it almost sounds like somebody's conducting an orchestra, you know? And, uh, so I'm going to do this little song. This is this is a song that I wrote, um, and it's me talking about um, my my wife, who I'm married to now. But it's before we got married, and it's me basically expressing, "Hey, 
you really want to do this? Are you, are you sure about this? Cause I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you a little bit about me and you know, you can see if you want to go any further. So this is called woman, woman. <laughs> Woman, woman, why you want to marry me? Woman, woman, who do you think I am? Are you certain this is what you really need? Woman, woman, help me to understand. Did you know I'm just a dreamer, a drifter all alone, a natural born to lose it anything I've ever done, with a gift for letting people down just when I'm needed most. Are you sure you made your mind up, woman, woman, I've got to know. Tell me, woman, is this what you really need? Hey, think it over. What do you got to lose? Tell me, woman, do you know what you see? Woman, woman, help me to understand. Even though I get this feeling, your love can change my ways. You can turn these lonely nights of mine into my better days. You would lay down your own life and close the gates to hell. Are you taking on too much, my woman, woman? Listen to me now. Woman, woman, why you want to marry me? Woman, woman, what do you think I am? Are you certain this is what you really need? Woman, woman, help me to understand. Woman, woman, thank you for loving me, my woman, woman, now that you really know, oh, here we go, my woman, woman, oh, here we go, my All right, Randy, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the time. And, uh, man, just, just keep doing it, bud. You're, 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 making, you're making a difference. I guarantee you. <laughs> I guarantee you you are, man. And you know it. So just, just keep doing it, bud. Well, thank you for those kind words. All right, my friend. Until next time. Good evening to you, Paul Leslie. All right, and to you.